Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Amen. Let's sing together, how firm a foundation. tonight is from 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has given us his Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me for a time of confession of sin. Lord, we call upon your name as your children, seeking to confess our sins to you, to acknowledge them. Lord, we see in this 1 Thessalonians passage the importance of acknowledging that you have set us aside in holiness and this includes not only our minds or what might be deemed spiritual, but how we conduct ourselves in our bodies. And given that, you call us to cleanness and not uncleanness. Lord, when it comes to our bodies and the desires that we have uh, still rooted in the struggle against our old man, Lord, we must confess to you tonight 
and acknowledge what you have here before us in the scriptures, that when we reject your word to us and how we conduct ourselves, we do not reject man, but we reject you. I ask, Lord, that you'd hear your saints now as they go into confession before you, and I pray that this would be a time where you'd even be leading them or using this as a means to lead them to repentance. Hear now your saints in the quiet of their heart as they confess their sins to you. Lord, we pray that you would take our confession and use it to move us towards life and life in you. We ask these things and confess them in the name of Christ. Amen. Your assurance of pardon tonight is taken from 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, <clears throat> that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, Come Down, O Love Divine. Let's open our scriptures together to Proverbs chapter 7. The reading tonight will take us through this entire chapter.
beginning in verse 1. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice, and I saw among the simple... I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. With an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. So I came out to meet you, diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For she has cast down many wounded, and all were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Let us pray. O Lord, you have given us this proverb that we might be trained to know your heart, that our senses would know good and evil. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that by your spirit you would train your congregation here tonight. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. Well, last week, oh no, not last week, uh, a week before, I don't remember the weeks, we looked at Proverbs chapter 6, and you can see a running theme here where we've been dealing with adultery for, and the strange or uh, seducing woman for multiple sermons. And last time we were together, we acknowledged a few things. The seduction and the serpent lead to death. We see that same thing here tonight, but we saw earlier also that Christ in his call leads to life. Christ loves his bride, the church. He does not want her to give up the blessings of their sacred love for the passing pleasures of this seductive world. Well, tonight we start with a new set of observations and going through seven, and so I'd like to begin by just noticing verses one through four together with you. In verses 1 through 4, the father is supplying commands. We're pretty used to this. In each of the lectures, going all the way up to what we would consider normal Proverbs in chapter 10, we have a series of moral lessons from the mother and from the father who represent the longstanding tradition under the eternal God. Here, verses 1 through 4 supply commands for us to take the moral catechesis or catechism seriously here in Proverbs. There's a a new saying, we haven't uh, seen this many times, a new saying, and it's helpful for us to, again, take the seriousness of the Father. He says this in verse 2 of our passages tonight, keep my commands and live, and then here's the new saying, and my law as the apple of your eye. The family's understanding of how to live is to be preserved, in other words, and protected 
as one protects the pupil of their eye. This most delicate and yet precious member of the human anatomy is essential for illumination and guidance. And the truth of the matter is, is that without it, there is only darkness. You can see how grave a matter it is that we would listen to the Father. That's the first thing I want you to notice is just verses 1 through 4 and just how serious it is that we would, be re- we would receive the word and hold it. That it would become a part of our very hearts. The second observation is from starting in verse 5. In verse 5, first, he shows what situation is on the father's mind, the seductress and her flattering words. As you can see from verses 6 through 23, the father is not content to just name the problem. Be careful of the seductress and her words. No, he's not content with that. He also paints a picture story. The father looks through the lattice of a window in verses 6 through 9. Do you see that? There is the window and the lattice, and he's looking out over a situation, a moral scene of a young man, a young man who is called uh, simpleton in the translation I read to you. You'll see gullible, but it's someone who is not yet committed to God and his ways. You wouldn't say they're uncommitted, but they're wavering, they're double-minded, they're not loyal yet. They're easily taken off of the path, and that's what we end up seeing. This young man wavers in his loyalty, verse 7, between the community of death and the community of life, between Christ and the world. The uncommitted youth, you see, decides to walk down her path. This is all being watched from this, this window from up on high. The strange woman meets him there, verse 10, and you know that he stands no chance. She lures him with every sensual pleasure. Did you see the pile on of sensuality that she brings, appealing to every sense? Silky Egyptian colors, perfumes, spices, the delights of love all night long, enticing speech, verse 21. She appeals to all his bodily pleasures, yet despite All the smells and sounds and sights, the father is very clear that from his window lattice view, this is a trap. But the son doesn't see it. The son can't see that she is like a spider sitting at the center of her web. Or, that's not the image he uses, as the father says, she captures him like a bird, shoots him in the liver. That's a second observation observations from the lattice window. The third observation is this. We come now to a concluding lesson that he wants all the children to hear. You could imagine his children gathered around the fire with the the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, and the father wants to speak the great lesson that he has learned from experience and from the Lord himself, and he says this. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. So don't think that you have a chance. Her house is the way to hell. Make no mistake, even though it doesn't look that way and it doesn't smell that way at first. But hear this, her house descends to the chambers of death. And now we come to our final observation before our teaching tonight, or the doctrine And that is that now that you see the content, I want you to notice the form. It's really important here, especially as we think about a discipleship. The father controls the narrative. The father controls the narrative and the description so that the disloyal and uncommitted youth can see the real nature and the real reality of the situation. That's the whole point of the elevated window. He has a God-like perspective. And this is important. The youth will grow in moral maturity, and this is the discipleship lesson. The, the, the whole point here, and as a part of this lecture, is that the youth will grow in moral maturity the more and more that they can see people and places and things and actions by way of the eyes of the Father. In other words, 
for the teaching this evening, we want to take verse 6. Look at it really closely. We want to take verse 6 as the paradigm or the model or the frame in the kind of discipleship and moral formation that we see in all of the lessons of the Proverbs and in all of discipleship. And it is this, for at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice. And we, therefore, have this following teaching for tonight. Christ teaches us that growing in moral wisdom is primarily being convinced of how he views all things. Christ looks through his window with the authorized view on all things. And we, as we are morally formed by him and his spirit, we must learn how Christ views things and see as he sees. We stand there in the lattice window with him looking out. That's discipleship. Learning to name things the way he names them. And so I'd like to look at just a, a few um, uses this evening. Uh, the first is uh, entitled Looking Through the Lattice, and then the second one is Discipleship. So let's look at Looking Through the Lattice and then Discipleship. I want to, um, I've given you the picture here. You see number, that verse number six is supposed to be the paradigm for what it means in large part to do discipleship and for moral formation. This should be especially interesting to teachers. All of us are teachers. Uh, in one way or another. But I want to proceed by giving you an example of this that was just given within the officer training about an hour ago. And it is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. With what you heard in Proverbs, especially in verse 6, with the window, think about that as I read this passage to you. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, have you not read this, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some of those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat? And he said to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. What I want you to do as you're thinking through our Proverbs passage and now this Luke 6, 1 through 5, is I want you to picture two windows because that's what we have in the Luke passage. In the one window sits the Pharisee. In the other window sits Christ. They both look down from their window on the disciples plucking the heads of grain. And the, perhaps the most interesting fact of it all is they end up with different interpretations of the act. The Pharisees, from their window, label the action unlawful. Christ, however, sees the action as lawful and in keeping with his intent for Sabbath laws. Well, we are fallen, and therefore naturally viewing things wrongly from the, from the window of the Pharisee or some other corrupt, corrupt perspective, but the point here that we're making especially by making verse 6 the paradigm for how we should be viewing this, is that the goal is that by the Spirit, we would see as Christ sees from his window in all our situations. You could just picture it this way. Discipleship, moral formation, what we're being taught here in this Proverbs by the actions of the Father, is sitting in the window with Christ, seeing what he sees, now, that doesn't happen all at once, but it's over time. There is a maturity by way of the Spirit, thinking Christ's thoughts after him. Well, the second thing I'd like to talk about more explicitly is just discipleship. This ends up providing what we have here in Proverbs chapter 7 with a specific application to this strange woman. It nevertheless provides something more general. It provides an excellent model for a Christian education, moral training, and discipleship. As we look through the lattice as Christ, we pass on our wisdom, and then we pass on our wisdom to the receptive you. That's what life in the church should look like. The question ends up being, but how? How are we supposed to do that? 
And part of the answer, and what sticks out most in the proverb that is before us, is by way of stories. The father gives stories that his disciples may may use those stories to see the situation as it really is. He tells, think of the stories that he tells. You could draw out. Some of them are just little summaries that have a, a world of a story behind them. He tells of a strange woman and the paths that this young man walks down. But think of the story behind the hunter and the hunted. That could be developed also. He tells of an ox going to slaughter. That in itself begs of a larger story. Though many stories can do the job, as we disciple, we must make sure that ourselves and those under our mentorship are familiar with the stories of the scripture. God has given us the stories for several purposes, but one major purpose that we're seeing here within Proverbs 7 is moral training. Our Heavenly Father, therefore, wants us to grow by becoming good at matching, the matching game. My daughter always beats me at the matching game. We lay out all the cards, I flip over, and it's a watermelon, and I'm supposed to remember where the watermelon was before when we flip it over, and I don't remember any of the cards before because I'm getting old, and she remembers them all. (laughs) There's a similar kind of matching game that's going on here that the Spirit uses. He wants to morally form us by his word, by Christ's directive and sending. He wants us, in other words, to match the stories and their moral evaluation and judgment to the specific cases that are in our everyday life. This is going to sound too simplistic, but it really does boil down to this, though it requires great sanctification by the Spirit. The ultimate act of moral reasoning sounds just like this. This reminds me of this biblical story. And that's what discipleship is is for us to finally be able to see ourselves, the people around us, and the world around us through the lens of Scripture. And that happens through the moral formation that happens through biblical stories. Let me just ask you a simple question by way of proof. Is that not what Jesus just did in Luke chapter 6, 1 through 5? He says, essentially, this reminds me of David and the showbread, which tells me you've got this wrong. So there are some questions that uh, face us when we begin to see discipleship and moral formation this way and how the Proverbs fit into that, the example that the Father gives us. What situations are you facing now that require some level of mature moral judgment? The follow-up question from that is, from whose lattice are you viewing the matter? With whom are you sitting and looking through their window? This is one of the, sometimes it sounds like we're, we're um, being overreactive as Christians or um, engaging in some of the, the nastiness that can be a part of a fundamental uh, Christianity. But this is why we become so concerned about uh, the television that we watch or the news that we watch or the movies that we watch or the those that we hang out with, because they become the things that we sit with and look out the window. You see the scene here in Proverbs chapter 7, right? You see the temptation of the young man? Do you see the role that the woman has in the temptation? Think of other communities that are not Christian. How would they characterize the situation? Would they say that he's in a bad spot? that he's like an ox going to be slaughtered, that he's like a bird that's going to be trapped, would they put it that way? There's several movies um, and songs, Hello, Mrs. Robinson, you know, all that stuff, that end up capturing different ways and different windows from which to view the exact same situation. So that's my question to you. What situations are you now facing that require some level of mature moral judgment and who's, from whose lattice are you viewing the matter? That's the great question throughout the whole Christian life. 
As a follow-up question, what stories in the scriptures have similarities to your situation? Talk to a mature Christian and see how those stories can help you to view your situation through the lattice with Jesus, and not just Jesus, but the experiences that Christ gives to his total community. It is a horrible thing to start from scratch with a new generation and not draw upon the large tradition of moral reasoning that the church has for thousands of years. So talk to Christians who are aware of that history. When they see the situation, they can see, ah, we struggled with this in 400 AD. Let's talk about it. We need people like that. And then the last thing I'll mention to you after these questions is I just want to show you a little picture of uh, the same thing that, I'm, that Proverbs 7 is saying, but in different words. Do me a favor and turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, and I'll read those to you. And I'd love it if you would meditate on this another time and see that Proverbs 7 is talking about the same thing in terms of discipleship and moral formation. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. I will start in verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And I'm just explaining to you by way of Proverbs 7 how the senses become exercised to discern both good and evil under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit. Christ teaches us that growing in moral wisdom is primarily being convinced of how he morally views all things. Christ looks through his window with the authorized view on all things, and we must learn how Christ views things and see as he sees. May Christ give us maturity that we might say, for at the window of my house, I looked with Jesus through the lattice. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, I do call upon you for a task that only you can accomplish, and that is to make your people morally wise. I pray this especially for the uncommitted and even disloyal youth who are aware of the teaching of the scriptures but are not committed to them. They waver and they ride the fence. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to mature and to get past the stage of being gullible and a simpleton and to really to, to begin to receive the words from your mouth and to build their house on the solid rock, which is you. Ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and we'll close our service with the song <clears throat> from Psalm 1.
Receive the Lord's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.